Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to continue solving uh, rel relatively simple problems related to gravitational potential. Uh, so today we will talk about the ring and the disk as the sources of gravitation. Now, um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics 14 presented on Unizor.com. Um, I suggest you to uh, watch this lecture and all others um, which are presented on this website uh, from the website itself um, because it's a course which means there are prerequisites, there are certain um, logical order between the lectures, obviously I'm using in any subsequent lecture whatever I was using before. Um, also on the same website there is a course called Math for Teens um, which you really have to know whatever is in that course to understand the physics routine, especially the calculus, because the whole physics is based on the calculus. All right, so going back to gravity integration two, and again, two problems. They, um, they will be by themselves in this lecture, but obviously I'm doing it for the purpose, and my purpose is the next lecture where I will use the solid uh, objects as the source of gravitation. So, right now uh, we will talk about, first is about the ring. So let's consider we have a ring which has certain mass m. It's infinitely thin. Um, its radius r and on the uh, perpend perpendicular Um, uh, line through the center perpendicular to the um, uh, to the plane where the ring is actually located uh, I will have certain point of interest uh, which is on the height h above this ring now obviously I will introduce the system of coordinates which is such that the disk is in the xy plane and obviously the z-axis is the one which is uh, which contains the point p on the height h above the xyz plane now i'm interested in the gravitational potential at point uh, p so point p coordinates are 0 0 h right now, as we know, the gravitational potential is an additive function, which depends, obviously, on the gravitational field. What it means is, if you have two sources of gravitational fields, uh, and basically they are combined, and in any particular point, we can measure the gravitational potential and it will be equal to the sum of gravitational potential of this field alone plus this field alone. I have proven this in one of the previous lectures. So, we will use this additive function of the gravitational uh, potential to derive the total gravitational potential of the ring. Now, uh, the obvious way how we do it in this and in any other case similar we will bring we will divide actually the ring into small pieces so this is an infinitesimal piece let's say its length dl i will measure the potential from this piece at this point and then i will integrate uh, uh, along this uh, circumference of the ring okay now what's simplification uh, of uh, what, what is a very simple property simple characteristic of this problem is that all these little dl's are on the same distance from um, from the point of interest now we know the general formula that for a point mass the gravitation depends on uh, gravitational constant mass of this point mass and divided the, by um, 
distance to point of interest from this point of mass. Now, it actually seems natural that in this particular case, since every little uh, uh, infinitesimal piece is on the same distance, and then when we, are s w w w when we will summarize this, we will probably have to summarize and get the total mass, basically. So most likely, I will have formula similar to this, where r is the distance from a point to uh, from the point on the ring to a point on um, point of interest uh, on the line on the z line, which is actually square root of r square plus h square, right? So intuitively thinking, I think I have to have this formula g times mass of the ring divided by the square root of r square plus h square because that's obviously the hypotenuse and this is right triangle however let's just um, not rely on our intuition let's try to derive it strictly mathematically okay so I'm going to basically have the same formula let me put it here in this form and we will see how it's derived in a relatively rigorous way so um, what I will do is I will have uh, the central angle from the horizontal x-axis to a radius on a ring again ring is in the x y uh, plane so let's have let's have it as as phi it's a variable and i will increment phi to phi plus g5 g5 so this is my segment so this is phi and the dotted line is phi plus uh, d phi. Now that actually cuts this infinitesimal. Now, if this is infinitesimal increment of the uh, angle, this would be incre uh, infinitesimal increment of the length uh, of the uh, arc, right? Which is equal to dl is equal to radius times angle. We know that, right? From geometry. So the line. Um, the uh, the length of the arc depends on the angle uh, using this formula. Well, again, that's actually why I was saying that the mass for teens is a prerequisite. You have to know all these little things. All right, so we have the dl. Now, we need the mass. Now, we have that the total mass of the ring is m, so the density of the mass, rho, is equal to m divided by the length. So this is 2 pi r. So 2 pi r is the length of the ring, and if I divide mass by the total length, I will have the density per unit of uh, length. Now, if I have the density, and now I have the length, dl, my dm, which is infinitesimal mass of this little piece, <coughs> is equal to rho density times dl which is um, m uh, r d phi divided by 2 pi r and r is out so we have m d phi divided by um, 2 pi Okay, so this is the mass. Now, if I know the mass of this, and I know the distance, distance is equal to square root of h square plus r square, right? I can determine the gravitational potential of this point, at this point, from this infinitesimal piece of my ring. So it's dv, v is gravitational potential, and dv is uh, increment 
uh, of the gravitational potential from this infinitesimal uh, piece of the ring is equal to g mass of this divided by distance r, which is which is g, dm is this, and divide by r, and again r is square root of r square plus h square. Now, what do I have to do to determine the total gravitational potential of an entire ring? Well, obviously I have to integrate my dv, well, v is actually a function of phi, right? We all know that. So that's why dv is actually this. Uh, from 0 to 2 pi, right? So my angle should be rotating entire uh, circle, which is equal to integral from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, instead of dv we will put this uh, g m d phi divided by 2 pi square root of r square plus h square now what's interesting is that these are all constants so we can go out um, outside of the integral and what will be the integral itself integral from 0 to 2 to 2 pi of d phi, which is actually equal to 1, right? Um, it's equal to uh, phi from uh, g m 2 pi square root of r square plus h square. The um, uh, indefinite integral is phi, right? Because the derivative from the phi would be uh, the differential from the phi will be d phi from 0 to 2 pi. So if we will substitute formula, Newton Leibniz formula, we will substitute from the phi, we will have 2 pi minus 0, which is 2 pi, and we will uh, cancel 2 pi, and we will have gm and square root, which is exactly what we have to prove. So our intuition is right, basically. Now, this is extremely simple case of, uh, well, relatively complicated object, the ring. But why is it simple? Because all the distances are exactly the same. And that's my first problem, which I wanted to present uh, today. My second problem would be slightly more complicated. It will be a disk instead of a ring. So let me wipe out this. Now, my drawing will be probably more or less the same, except now, again, now this is x, mass is m, and this is y. But now this is a solid, although infinite, I infinitely thin, um, disk. So, mass is now distributed along a disk, not along the ring, right? Which means my density is equal to mass divided by pr square, right? Because this is the area. Now my mass is distributed not along the circumference of the ring, but along the entire surface of the disk. So this is... Now, how do I approach this problem? <coughs> in, in exactly the same fashion. When I had a ring, I divided by little segments of the ring, little arches, right? Now, 
if I have a disk, but I will divide it into I will divide it into concentric rings. Now each one will be very very thin. So my variable which I'm going to use will be R, which will be from zero to capital R. Capital R is the radius of the entire disk. Now R is a radius of a one of the infinite number of the concentric rings, right? Um, now my width uh, of the ring will be infinitesimal. It will be from R to R plus dr. So it will be a very very thin ring, and I would like actually to use the formula which I have derived before. Now remember for the ring, it was um, mass g mass divided by square root of h square plus r square. Now in this case my ring is r square because there are many rings. I'm talking about any ring on a distance on a, on a radius r. And instead of m I will have basically the dm because it's an infinitesimal infinitesimal width of the ring right now how can i find out dm r basically i understand what r is now h is also not exactly h h would be my no h would be the same h sorry h would be the same h it's R which is different. R is changing. So what's my mass of the ring? Well, if I know the, uh, the density, I have to just know the area of the ring. So what is the area of the ring? If this is R and this is R plus dr, now my uh, area of the ring is pi R plus dr, square minus pi r square, right? The total area of the circumference of the incremented ring minus this one, which is equal to pi times uh, uh, r square plus 2r dr plus dr square minus pi r square which is equal to 2 pi r dr plus uh, plus something which is which we can actually um, ignore because it's an infinitesimal of the higher order. You see the square? So whenever we will integrate it will just disappear. So basically my area is this and since I know the density I can calculate the mass. So dm which is mass of the ring which is equal to um, m divided by pi r square times 2 pi r dr. So I have the mass. Well, pi obviously goes out. So we have m r dr 2 divided by r square okay now that's my m now my dv which is differential of gravitational potential of the ring only I will use this formula it would be g now dm so it's 2m r dr 
divided by r square and divided by square root of h square plus r square. All I have to do now is to integrate it by r. This is all function of r. r is my radius of uh, variable radius of the uh, of the small ring. Uh, so r is changing from zero to capital R of d. That's my potential. All right. Let's do this. So now it's just technicality. And as you see, physics is a lot of mess. Now, um, here is very uh, simplifying, basically, consideration. You see, this is r square, and this is 2r dr. Now, we know that r square derivative is equal to 2r, right? So, basically, we can consider this, this, and this as differential of r square, right? Differential of r square would be a derivative, which is 2r times differential of r dr. However, I will do it even better since I can always add the constant to a function without changing the derivative, I can say that this is equal to 2r dr, right? Because, you know, the um, derivative of sum is sum of derivatives, so I still have 2r, and this is 0, because it's a constant. So what my integral now becomes is from 0 to r, of um, gm divided by r square should be outside of the integral because they are constants. Now inside I will have d of r square plus h square divided by square root of um, r square. That would be I changed the order, doesn't really matter. Equals. Now, what makes sense now is to substitute, let's say y is equal to r square plus h square. So I have g m r square. g m is not a general motors, it's the multiplication of a universal gravitational constant by the mass of the disk. Now, um, integral, now, if I will replace this, then if r is equal to 0, then y is equal to uh, h square. But if r is equal to r square, that would be r square plus h square. dy divided by square root of y. And now we are in a familiar territory of a very simple integral. Now, again, square root of y derivative is equal to, this is a, a very familiar, it's y to the power of one half, right? So anyway, it's, the derivative is this. So we can guess that basically our integral is equal to 2 square root of y. Because if I will do the derivative from y, it will be 1 over 2 square root of y. 2 and 2 will cancel, and I will have just 1 over square root of y. So that's my derivative. So that's my independent, uh, in, in infinite integral, uh, which has to be from h square to r square plus square, plus h square. And obviously, this multiplier still exists. And the answer is...
my potential of the disk is equal to g times m divided by r squared. So m is the mass of the disk, r is its radius. Then I have 2. And then in parentheses I will have square root of r squared plus h squared minus square root of h squared, which is h. And that's the answer. This is a gravitational potential of the disk. Okay, now, before um, ending this letter on this note, uh, I would like to tell why I'm doing this exercise. Well, first of all, it's obviously useful by itself. It's something which really develops your fluency in using your mathematical apparatus to physical problems. But I also have another goal in mind. On the next lecture, I will consider a solid ball as the source of gravity. And I will divide it into, sli I will slice it actually into, every, into, into individual disks of infinitesimal widths. And I will use this formula, obviously, for gravitational potential of the disk. And then I will integrate it among all the different uh, disks. So that will be the next one. And for now, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck, actually.